Father, we thank you for your love. Jesus, we thank you for your love. Thank you for choosing to take the fall. Thank you for coming to earth to be born in human flesh, suffering all of our pain so that we could have salvation with you. Thank you. Father, we come to this part of our service to participate in worshiping you by being obedient unto your word and bringing our tithes and our offerings to you. Receive our tithe and receive our offering. That Christ may continue to be manifested through this part of your body. In Jesus' name we pray.
Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. <clears throat> this was the first census taken while Quirinius was go governor of Syria. And everyone was on his 
uh, way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judah, Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. <clears throat> in order to register along with Mary who was engaged to him and she was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth and she gave birth to her firstborn son and she wrapped him in clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into the heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as it had been told. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you. You may be seated. As many times as you have heard the Christmas story or heard this passage, the Christmas passage, the story of the birth of Christ, have you ever asked yourself this question? What can I learn from Christmas? What can I learn from Christmas? Well, as you think about Christmas and the wondrous story of, of uh, the birth of our Savior, um, there's a lesser known incident from Jesus' early childhood that I found a somewhat interesting. And I believe that uh, this incident plays an important role in the Christmas story. You see, before Jesus reached his second birthday, he had already become the target of an assassination plot. An assassination plot by the ruthless and paranoid king, King Herod. Now, King Herod was so paranoid that he killed his own son, who he thought was trying to take over his kingdom. Herod, Herod was afraid that this child, that this baby was going to grow up and take over his kingdom. And when he heard the story from the, the uh, 
uh, wise men, when they came and, and began to share with him all that, that they had learned from history and from studying and all of that, that the king of the Jews was to be born there. Uh, the scripture says that everybody was concerned. <laughs> <laughs> they figured some heads would start rolling. Well, understand now. It took the wise men probably a year and a half to travel from where they were in the east to Jerusalem. Now, I know the nativity scene has got... Uh, you know, the angels and all that, and it's, it's got the wise men all around it bringing their gifts and all of that. But folks, realistically, when you look at the scripture and you study it and you understand the difference in, in the words, the, the, the Greek that was written, uh, what we just read, the, the Greek says baby, a child, a baby. Okay, but when you go over a little bit further, when the wise men came, the word that is used is a child, which means he wasn't a baby. He was an infant, yes. Probably a year to a year and a half. Okay, as most scholars think that. Now Herod heard all of this, and he began to think, okay, this is not good for me. So, uh, he was kind of calculating here how old this baby might be. And so he figured, okay, what I'm going to do is be on the safe side. I'm going to have every boy child that's two years old or younger killed, murdered. <clears throat> and that's what he did at that time. Now, <clears throat> Joseph and Mary were living not in the stable at that time. They were living in a house at that time. Okay? And the Lord came to them in a dream and told them that they needed to take the baby, the infant, Jesus, and go to Egypt. Now, <clears throat> Can you imagine, men, do you remember when that first child was born? I remember when Jason was born in, in Plainview, Texas, in the hospital. And, and I, I, I was, I, I think there's probably about a three-foot path in the hallway out there that I was walking up and down. And I remember when I was able to hold that precious little boy in my heart. And I began to think about the responsibility that had just been laid upon my shoulders. Guys, can you imagine the sense of responsibility that must have weighed heavy upon Joseph's heart as he realized that he was the caretaker of the very God of the universe. That he was chosen, he and Mary had been chosen to be caretakers. And here, in his arms, in the flesh, was the Creator. His Creator. Yeah. <coughs> Jehovah God. The, 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 the word, the, the name that he could not say because it would have been irreverent. They never said Jehovah. And we don't even know for sure if Jehovah's the right word because they left the vowels out. And they only had consonants. And then we just kind of added the vowels a little bit later and we came up with the word Jehovah. 
The priests themselves would never say Jehovah. Here in Joseph's arms was The Messiah that he had been taught would be coming. In the flesh. In his arms. You know there's something else that I, I find extremely interesting. God told Joseph and Mary to take this humble infant King of kings and Lord of lords and take him and hide him in the country, in the nation where he delivered the Jews from centuries earlier, multiple generations earlier. In fact, many theologians <coughs> believe that the, the, the Pharaoh that uh, what was Pharaoh at, at that time was a man by the name of Amenhotep the top. Amenhotep. Amenhotep the second. I'm probably not saying that right, but, but anyway, uh, the, the time frame is 1453 to 1426 B.C. All right? And that was the Pharaoh that many theologians believe was there at the time of the Exodus. Now, while the Scripture gives no indication whether or not the people in Egypt actually knew of Jesus' arrival and, and, and his, his divine and, and, and royal identity, if they had known, they certainly would have expected him to be a king. That's for sure. You see... According to nearly 3,000 years of Egyptian history, Egypt's kings and pharaohs were rich beyond imagination. And they were very powerful. They used their wealth like a weapon. They built massive cities and commanded huge armies and lived in lavish homes. They ate the best of the best of the food. They wore the most extravagant jewelry and spared no expense when it came to their own comfort or standard of living. Not only did they live extravagantly, but because of their religion, their standard of dying wasn't anything to be sneezed at either. You see, their custom was to pack their burial chambers with the supplies that they believed that they would need as they traveled into the afterlife. For example, we all know about King Tut and, and what was found in, in, in his tomb. Obviously, they had heard of, never heard of the expression you can't take it with you. <laughs> However, expecting to live forever wasn't Pharaoh's only outrageous aspiration. Records indicate that the Egyptian kings assumed that they were given supernatural status. You see, the Pharaoh was thought to be responsible for bringing the floods that watered the Egyptian crops. So that he then received all of the credit for all of the water that came in and flooded the ground so that they could grow their crops and everybody would be fed. That's why it's important when you realize that Joseph, as he was telling the prophecy to the Pharaoh, seven years of good and seven years of bad. Okay, so God was beginning to say, you think you're God? I don't think so. Anyway, you see, the Pharaoh was idolized. 
His statue was bowed down before, and citizens would worship him because he claimed to be the manifestation of a God. Now, um, I don't know if I'm going to say this name right, but I'm going to try. Akin Aten, uh, Egyptians' uh, uh, famous or uh, infamous uh, uh, heretic uh, Pharaoh banished the national pantheon and proclaimed himself to be the living incarnation of the sun god Ra. One more there. Now, I had no idea what that sun god looked like, so I looked it up, and that's the picture that was on the internet. Now, that red thing above the head of that bird-like creature or with a human body, well, I guess that's supposed to be the sun. But this, this uh, Egyptian pharaoh, this Akhenaten, uh, he believed that he was God incarnate himself. Now, whether it's the ancient pharaohs demanding the worship of others or millions of modern skeptics today who reject God and attempt to dethrone God as creator and worship themselves, man's inerrant pattern has always been to lift himself, to exalt himself above all others. However, this rebellion against God can take no higher form than the form of self-love. Amen. Pride. Amen. In other words, a self-centered man is a person seeking his own interests at the expense of others. Amen. Now, the word man is generic. Ladies, you fall in that category too. <laughs> Believe it or not, that is precisely the condition in which you and I wallowed in before we were saved. And ultimately, that is where everyone remains today if they have never personally acknowledged their sinners and their need for Jesus Christ and have trusted Him as Savior and Lord. And while history is crowded with men who have claimed to be God, folks, there is only one God. Not Allah. Not Mohammed. Not Buddha. And I can go on and list them all. You know only one God, and that is Jehovah God. Amen. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Jesus Christ. Now, let's stop just for a moment and consider what it meant for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus, to come to earth. For Him to come to earth as a man in order that you and I might have salvation, that we might be spared the, the flaming fires of hell, the torture of eternity, eternity of being separated from love. Well, first, the King of Heaven left His throne and took a stable in a very lowly place. Adrian, when Cheyenne was born, y'all went to all the expense <laughs> to, 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 to fix up a nursery just for that precious little girl, did you not? You never even began to think about, well, I see there's that old shed out there in the back of the church out there. I think we'll just uh, have the baby in the nursery set out there. That didn't <laughs> even begin to enter your mind, did it? No. no. Well, you see, Jesus left 
heaven. And, and, and Scripture tells us that eye has not seen and, and mind has not begun to understand my paraphrase, of what heaven is all about. Amen. Jesus left that to come and live not in a little shack like that, but to live in a cave, to be born in a cave, to, to be put in, in, in a wooden trough, trough. trough. Yeah. that had First class, perfectly clean straw, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. And to be put in. Have you ever gone to sleep in a pile of hay? That is the most uncomfortable stuff. It is not soft. It's, it's very itchy. Yes. Very itchy. Yeah. That's why she wrapped the baby in clothes, swaddling cloth. Now that's a whole different sermon there. <laughs> but he chose to come and to be born and to be laid in that trough. Second, the very Son of God was hunted by a tyrant king and became an infant in exile in Egypt. He left heaven and became the lowest of low. Third, the source of all wisdom and knowledge was born into poverty and lived without earthly wealth and luxury. You remember Jesus telling the rich young man that came said, I want to follow you? And Jesus said, I don't have a place to lay my head. I don't have a place to sleep. Are you willing to? left heaven to come to earth. You know, every time I think about it, I'm amazed that the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he who was holy without blemish, would choose to become a human. Amen. I'm amazed because he knew that he would be battered with every temptation Satan would throw at him. Yet, Jesus resisted each one to its fullest force. The king of creation willingly, folks, subjected himself to all of what it means to be a human being. He willingly subjected himself to pain. He willingly subjected himself to hunger, to thirst, to sorrow, and even physical exhaustion. In fact, he subjected himself to every emotion possible for a human being to go through. And yet, he did it without sinning even one iota. And in the unfathomable act of, of selfless and sacrificial love, Jesus left heaven, heaven's glory, to die for all sinners. He offered mercy to a people who deserved only His wrath. He stooped to accomplish that which we only could hope to do, but know that we wouldn't do. It, it, you see, in love, the God of the universe stepped from eternity to intervene in human history and save those who were utterly unable to save themselves. When I stop and observe how we ooh and ah the precious little picture of Jesus at Christmas time, my heart sometimes is saddened 
at the thought that the vast majority of the people that are standing there saying, Oh, how cute. Isn't that precious? I love that picture of that little baby. Have you ever been to a Christmas program where they've had a, a, a live presentation of Jesus? And, you know, the baby and the mother's holding that. I did when I was at Lackland Baptist Church when I was minister of music there. Uh, we, we did that <laughs> I can remember hearing <coughs> behind me when 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 Joseph and Mary and the camp with a real baby. It was alive. It wasn't a doll. It was a baby, and and he was doing all of this, everything. And I could hear the people back. Oh, how cute! How cute! How cute! But I wonder how many of those. Who would do in an odd with that? Really knew what that was all about. If they really knew who the baby represents, or how this Christmas story applies to their their lives. In fact, there are times that I wonder if we really understand the Christmas. What can we learn from Christmas? In a word, I believe the lesson that we learn is that Christmas is love. You see, Christ's love is love that was manifested in His birth, in His life, in his death and in his resurrection. Folks, his love is, is, is a love that, that, that sacrificed, a, a love that sought not his own needs, but the needs of, of others. His love is a love that does not count what it might lose but what others would gain. His love is a love that emptied itself in order that others might be filled. His love is, is a love that humbled himself in order that others might be filled up. His love is a love that gave to the very end and gave without thought for self or self-gain. It all happened in a moment, a most remarkable moment. You know, as, as, as moments go, that one appeared no different than any other. But in reality, that particular moment was like another. For through that segment of time, a, a spectacular thing occurred. God. Whew, God became man. Amen. While the creatures of earth walked unaware, divinity arrived. Heaven opened herself and placed her most precious one in a human womb. God as a fetus? Oh. Holiness. Sleeping? In a womb? Women? I can't even begin to relate to this, but I know you can The creator of, of life being created in human form in the womb. God was given eyebrows, elbows, 
two kidneys in the spleen. He stretched against the walls and floated in the amniotic fluid of his mother. God, through the ultimate miracle, had come near to man. He came not as a flash of light or as an unapproachable conqueror, but as one whose first cries were heard by a peasant girl and a sleepy carpenter. You know how, how, how we, we're so obsessed with cleanliness today? <laughs> Think about it. The hands that first held Jesus were unmanicured. <laughs> Carlos, I mean... Think about it. They were calloused. And folks, they were dirty. Downright dirty. No silk, no ivory, no ivory. Were it not for the shepherds, there would have been no reception at all. And were it not for a group of stargazers, there would have been no gifts. To think of Jesus in such a light, well, I don't know, it, it kind of seems almost irreverent, doesn't it? It's not something we like to do. It's uncomfortable. It's much easier for us to keep the humanity out of the incarnation. It's easy to think about cleaning the manure around the, 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 the manger. And, and wipe the sweat out of his eyes or pretend that he, that he never snored or blew his nose or <laughs> hit his thumb with a hammer. But don't do it. For heaven's sakes, don't! Let him be as human as he intended to be. Let him, let him into the muck and mire of your life of this world. For only if we let him in can he pull us out. Amen. Thank you. Have uh, have you let Jesus into the muck and mire? of your life in 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 John tells us if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness that simply means folks that if you have muck and mire in your life he will cleanse your life and, and, and remake you into a clean person, a pure, sinless person. Do you want that? Wouldn't that be good? Isn't that a wonderful thought? Don't you want your life to, to, to be like that instead of all of that other mess? Well, first, you must be convinced that Christ is the Son of God. And that He did everything that needs to be done for you to become one of God's children. You must Admit that you're a sinner and that you need Christ in your life. Next, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That He was born of a virgin and that He died for your sins, past, present, and future. And that He was buried and three days later, he rose from the dead and is seated right now at the right hand of God the Father. In essence, 
You must believe and accept his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection as a sacrifice and payment for your sins. Our altar is open this morning. If anyone here desires to, to come and pray and kneel at the front or sit at the, at, at the pew, I encourage you to come. However, the Holy Spirit of God is dealing with you right now in, in your heart and life. I'm asking, submit yourself to Him. If God has spoken to your heart, and you say, look, I, Pastor, I want to trust Christ. And I ask you to do that. Just simply by faith. Say, Lord, please forgive me. Cleanse me. Come to my heart. Be my Savior, Lord. And then come and tell me that that's what you did. That's so important that you do that. You see, why? Because in, in, in Matthew... Chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. The words of Jesus Himself, He said, Therefore, whoever confesses Me before men, him I will confess before My Father who is in heaven. But the next verse, Jesus said, But whoever denies Me, in other words, whoever does not confess Me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So if, if, if you're saying, I want to trust Jesus, but you're not serious enough about it to actually say, yes, Jesus is my Savior and my Lord, and I place my life and trust in him. If you're not serious enough to stand and proclaim that, then Jesus is saying, you don't really mean it. And if you don't mean it, you're lukewarm. And what does the Bible say about lukewarm? He will spew you out of his mouth. So be serious and be genuine, trusting. And by coming here, when I stand down here, you can come to me and say, Pastor, I've heard the voice of Jesus and I've given my life to him. Maybe... Maybe you've already done that and you just kind of backslid and, and, and you haven't been as faithful to Him as you want. You know you should be. Then come and tell me. I'm recommitting my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. I choose to follow Him. If you have decided to commit your life to Jesus or recommit your life to Him, I want you to come and tell me about it. For those of you that are listening and watching by live stream, I want you to call me on my cell phone. 210-241-7235. 210-241-7235. As soon as the service is over. And let me know that you've given your heart or recommitted your heart and life. So important that you do that. As we stand and as we sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Will you make that decision for Him today? As we sing.